Yes, a very warm welcome to a new episode of the seventh podcast season of New Female Leaders. Now, every woman should be able to decide over her own body. Also during childbirth. Today, I speak with, and I'm a little bit starstruck, I have to say that, with Millie Hill. Millie, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for inviting me and thank you for being starstruck. <laughs> <laughs> well, why am I starstruck? Because, well, you're an author and a freelance journalist uh, and an advocate for women's choices and rights in general and in childbirth. And you've written a book that I really love. Well, you've written three books, but today we speak about your book, Give Birth Like a Feminist. And yeah. it has been widely praised for raising the specific issue for women's right in the birth room itself. Well, thank you so much for being our guest. And uh, I'm really excited to dive into this topic together with you. Um, let's start with what does female empowerment have to do with what happens in the birth room? Well, that's a good question. And it's a question that I guess I hadn't considered at all myself, really, until I was pregnant for the first time. Um, my eldest child is 14 now, so quite a long time ago. Um, but I think what, what happens is when you are pregnant, you come into pregnancy from the other worlds that we women are now able, thank God, to inhabit. Um, you know, the world of work, um, the world of trying, you know, forging towards uh, equal footings in relationships, having a sense of your own uh, autonomy and rights. Mm. And then suddenly you're thrown into this new place. Um, and that's what happened to me. And I felt quite surprised by the difference in the dynamics, the power dynamics. Um, in my interactions during pregnancy with healthcare professionals and in the way people talked about my autonomy and my choice, um, not just health professionals, but everybody. Um, now that I was pregnant, it seemed to be different. So that's kind of what threw me into starting to consider that idea of, you know, um, positive birth and can you still, uh, you know, have... <laughs> be autonomous and empowered in your birth experience in the same way that you hopefully are in other areas of your life as a woman in the 21st century. Right. So Millie, you speak about power dynamics and it's also good to, to mention that uh, you're from the UK. Uh, yeah. Can you, can you give us a brief idea of the context um, childbirth is in? What do you mean? Like, as we speak right now yeah and 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 yeah what is the current situation in the uk well um i think where we are at now where everyone is at the moment is post covid so um what was already a pretty difficult situation um in terms of certainly in the uk in terms of resources funding in our nhs numbers of midwives um etc is worse than ever because mm. of the pandemic so we're not really in a very good place for um, childbirth in the UK at the moment, unfortunately. It's very underfunded. Right, right. And and when, when we look at, for instance, the difference between um, home birth and uh, uh, birth in hospital, I think there's a difference, right, between the Netherlands, the UK, and what you see worldwide. Yes, I think um, you guys have a better track record of um, sort of home birth and uh, normal or natural or physiological birth than we do here in the UK. Um, in the UK, our home birth rates are very low. And uh, at the moment, as I said, because of the pandemic, they're lower than ever because uh, the quite often, you know, the first thing to get cut if there's any kind of issue is home birth, um, because it's felt that hospital birth is the default and home birth is the kind of luxury extra so that's um for some women home birth is even more difficult to access at the moment in the uk than ever before so the, the numbers are probably I'm, just, I'm assuming going down even lower right <laughs> so we don't know yet and 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 when you look worldwide i mean you you give a lot of um uh, figures uh, facts and figures also in your book uh, you see that there's um, a tendency of medically medically medical 
what is medicalization <laughs> thank you <laughs> yeah. medicalization of childbirth especially in the western world yes definitely and you know there's there's um there's kind of like a sweet spot i think where you know um what, what we need is we need very very low tech relationship based midwife led woman centered care with the backup of the medical system that's the ideal so, you know, there are some parts of the world where they've got one, but not the other, and some parts of the world where they've got the other, but not the one, if that makes sense. And, mm. and it's it's trying to find that kind of Goldilocks zone where um, you have just the right amount of both that seems to be a really impossible challenge. Um, and often what happens is we veer towards, um, in, certainly in the Western world, we, we veer much more towards the uh, sort of techno medical model of birth and we lose the, the humanized aspect, which is what women also need. Right. So we, we need that low tech environment, that that safe bubble, you know, but we need the medical backup too. Because yeah. that doesn't always go according to plan. Yeah, sure. And and um you spoke about power dynamics. Um and I'm curious, this has probably also to do with why you think feminists should care more about birth, right? Yeah, well, I mean, I think, um, you know, the thing, you know, I was talking about earlier how, you know, you, you sort of suddenly the light bulbs go on for you when you was pregnant yourself. And I noticed as well, like after I'd had my baby and well, during my first pregnancy and after I'd had my first baby, conversations that I had with other women, you know, the toddler groups or the, the baby groups or, you know, family members or whatever, it just seemed like so many women that I spoke to had had, um, you know, a, a loss of bodily autonomy, traumatic birth, um, birth in which they didn't feel listened to or respected. Um, and it also often felt like that was something that women just accepted as part of the deal. Mm. Like being a woman is just the short straw anyway. And then childbirth is another really kind of like major aspect of that short straw. And so even though it's really awful, it's not something that we should complain about. It, that's just, you know, part of the raw deal. Um, and so, yeah, that put on, turned on a lot of, um, you know, feminist flags for me because I was just surprised by, by those, that, that, that power imbalance and the way that women felt that they didn't have a voice, but that not only did they not have a voice, but that was something that just shouldn't, didn't need to be challenged that's the feminist area for me is how, you know, we, as feminists, our priority should be women. That's what feminism is. It's about caring about women's lives, noticing when they get, are, are getting a raw deal and doing something about it, using our voices to fight back and say, we want better. Mm. And it just seems to me that childbirth is one area where that doesn't happen enough. There's not enough women saying we want better. We deserve better. So when we look at um, the history of birth, yeah. Um, uh, um, you also mentioned like so the question like when women's bodies became men's businesses um, when did that happen can 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 you uh, share a bit of the let's say um, key points in history where yeah the current situation is kind of a result from yeah, I mean, I actually went back over that chapter today and wrote down a kind of timeline because I knew you were going to ask me about this <laughs> and I, I wanted to have a really sort of good handle on it. And I actually found it really interesting to revisit and it really sums up so much of what we're talking about. So I'll try and talk you through it. And forgive me if it takes me too long. Stop me if I go on too long. But it is obviously history is quite long. <laughs> yes, no worries. We've got quite a lot of, you know, ground to cover. But if you look back to, you know, sort of pre 14th century, um, we don't really know much about um, what childbirth was like then, but we, some people speculate that we had more of a goddess culture. So that's an interesting thing to, to, to ponder. Um, this idea of, you know, the divine feminine and, you know, that sort of being part of the way people thought about birth and the world at that time. Then we have Christianity coming in. And in Christianity, we have the concept of the, the male God, the father and the son, and the feminine is sidelined. Mm -hmm. 14th to 16th century, we have the witch hunts, which a lot of people know about. Um, but what a, a lot of people don't realize is that 85% of those uh, people who were burned in the witch hunts um, were 
female. Um, and many of those people were what we would think of as midwives. So they were, they were burned and persecuted because they were healers, um, herbalists, wise women, uh, women at the margins, older women. And those were often the people who were persecuted during that time. So then coming through at the same time is the profession of the doctor, exactly. the, the physician. Um, and they said in their, their handbook for the, the witch burnings was called the Malleus Maleficarum. Mm -hmm. um, and in that it says, if a woman dare to cure without having studied, she is a witch and must die. So you've got that kind of patriarchy coming through of the male doctor being the authority, the scientific expert, and the woman being the mad old wife who doesn't know anything, you know, and being marginalized. And at, the, at that time, what would have been the perfect thing to happen would be for um, both sides to listen to and learn from each other. Because the doctors were exploring things about the human body that hadn't ever been explored by people before that could have been hugely insightful. And yet the, the women, the healers had a lot of uh, folk knowledge that they could have shared together. So that's the great tragedy for, in the history of, of medicine really. Mm. But then what happened was the, the, male, the male side dominated in the 16th and 17th centuries, we have what was called the barber surgeons coming through, which was, <laughs> makes me laugh because oh, it's this yeah. idea that there's like, there's two things you can do with sharp stuff, you know, like haircuts and surgery. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. when I read that part of, I was like, oh my God, like it's. Yeah. It became pretty barbaric at that time yeah. because um, the men were trying to invent sort of tools basically that could be used to help in childbirth. and in some, some situations, they actually did help. And in other situations, they, they were extremely damaging. Um, and one of the main tools that we still have today that we all know about is the forceps. So it was around the early 17th century that the forceps were invented. And then another interesting, very patriarchal thing happened, which was that men realized this is a, there's, there's money to be made here. Mm. And the, force, the story of the forceps is a classic example of that. The forceps were kept secret. Um, even though they were actually at times helpful in childbirth and, and life-saving, they knew they could make money out of them. So they didn't want anyone else to get their hands on them. So they used to charge a really, really high price, around about £5,000 in today's money for coming in with their forceps. But they would bring it in in this secret chest and it was all kept under this cloak of secrecy for several generations just to make money. So this whole idea about you know birth as an industry, birth for profit, came in and then that's kind of rolled forward right through the 1880s all the way through um, the, you know, men coming in, um, a, a, several examples of forceps being used, you know, even when they weren't needed, just because they could, they could charge basically. Right. So there was a, there was money to be made from, for doctors getting involved in every single birth, not just the ones that needed help. Mm. And that forceps gave them this paid role um, and forceps also meant the lithotomy position, which we're all so familiar with today, women getting on their backs. Right. Um, yeah, because that was necessary in order to use a tool, right? And and yeah. and can you um, give a, a, a small description of the forceps so that everybody understands what you, what you mean? Because probably... Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like salad servers, I suppose. So they're like, um, they, you know, they go around each side of the baby's head yeah. And they can be used uh, to guide the baby right. out. So yeah. a baby who is not coming out, who's stuck, yeah, they can use them uh, to pull them out. Pull them out, basically. Yeah. So yeah, so that's that's kind of like takes you up to almost the beginnings of what you can see today. Um, you've got the uh, the eighteenth century birth room was the doctor and a and a midwife. Um, what we used to be called the god sibs, who were, uh, you know, the, the, the really, really going back in time idea of, of before all this, before the uh, invention of the forceps and everything, this idea of, the, of birth space being uniquely female, only women allowed. Um, and the god sibs were the women who would come in, um, all chatting, bringing their cakes, bringing their herbs, bringing their, um, their stories, their songs to surround the woman. And they would have had knowledge um, of what to do if things weren't going right. They would have had herbal knowledge, et cetera. They were banished. 
So you've got the 18th century birth room, doctor and midwife, a bit like what we know now. So being on a bed on your back with people you don't know very well, which is kind of like the modern way, isn't it? And then uh, into that space came the idea of pain relief, because obviously you've got you haven't got any of the other comfort that you would have had. So then you had chloroform coming in, which was used by Queen Victoria, which made it very desirable. Um, and then, yeah, and, and the with the chloroform, the whole idea was that you were that the woman was completely passed out, right? Or like almost. Uh, or... Yeah, I think I think it would knock you out, but not as much as the thing that came after that, which okay. was the twilight sleep. Okay, that was the really hardcore stuff, right? <laughs> Um, so there was a kind of wave of feminism in the 1920s um, that, you know, alongside uh, suffrage and women campaigning for the vote that said, we will not put up with having these awful births. The, the two choices for, you know, women around about that time, if they were poor, was to go to these hospitals called the lying in hospitals, mm -hmm. where um, they would quite often die of infection because there was very little understanding about hand washing. Mm. But if they were rich, they would have this home birth with the doctor with his forceps. Yeah. So at that time, women said, we don't want this. We want to escape from this. It's our right as women to be absent from this horror. And that was when Twilight Sleep came in. <laughs> am, I te am I talking too much? No, 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 no. <laughs> Love it. It's just fa it is fascinating, isn't it? When yeah. it does give you an insight into how we how we got where we are. I, exactly. Yeah, the, the Twilight Sleep was a really horrific um, drug that basically the way I understand it is you don't have any memory of the birth at all. And sometimes women wouldn't even recognize their own babies or know that they'd given birth. But you are at the same time, you're totally aware and conscious while it's happening. Right. So you would have to be um, straight jacketed or uh, and blindfolded, um, be sort of put in a padded crib because you would thrash around so much and shout, scream. Um, but then you would have no memory of it. So for a while that was really really popular for quite a few decades and then coming towards the present day we had sort of had another wave of feminism that said hang on a minute we don't want that we don't want that kind of and you know the the, the sort of 1950s kind of birth was very very much the sort of no agency no autonomy doctor knows best kind of thing so then you had the the birth of you know organizations like the NCT and Ina Mae Gaskin's farm in America. Yeah. Um, so the, the interesting thing I think that of where we are now is that what you have there is you had a sort of countercultural uh, feminist push towards mm. women's autonomy, but still a very, very strong sort of techno medical model of birth. Mm. And that's kind of what we've seen coming through the last few decades really as well. You know, the 1980s, there was another um, wave of, of feminist activism with women saying they wanted to get off their backs and doctors saying one doctor um, said in a, in a London hospital that it was animalistic for a woman to give birth on all fours and that sparked a big protest in London um, but so there's always been this you know sort of push and pull all the way through that story I've just told you between the you know, the, the cultural and the countercultural and the feminist and the patriarchal. And it's quite interesting, I think, the way it sort of flows through. And we still have it now. We still have, you know, the argument, if you like, is it is it more feminist to go to hospital and have an epidural mm. and or, or an elective cesarean? Um, or is it, you know, is it more feminist to have your kind of like, um, you know, experience of birth where you feel everything and you you give, you give birth to your baby under your own steam yeah that, that's been that sort of push and pull between those two ideas kind of runs through it all really yeah so Millie thank you so much for sharing because I think for many people this is you know uh, completely new like to hear this historical path of and and to understand perhaps also better what why we are where where we are now um yeah. What are the, according to you, the underlying assumptions of how we look at birth? Like what, what when when you have this timeline, like what what are the underlying assumptions that we perhaps still have now? Well, I think one theme that maybe runs through it all is a lack of trust in women. Mm. Um, 
And that's why you get the erosion of autonomy, um, not just in the birth room, actually, but everywhere in women's lives, I think. Mm -hmm. This idea that women, women's bodies can't be trusted, women's voices can't be trusted, women's accounts of their own experiences or their own pain um, or their own needs are not reliable and therefore they need to be managed and controlled. I would say that for me is the thing that runs through it all. Yeah, and 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 if you look at that, um, and you look at the way we look at uh, female leadership and um, perhaps even em um, emancipation of women, like what is the uh, what is the linkage between the two? Because what I've learned from your book and what I start to understand is that, okay. So what actually happens in the birth room and what happens at this kind of yeah super crucial point in a lot of women's lives, um, and on, not only in the lives of women but also very often of their partners who don't know either what is really going on. Um, it it kind of reflects also how um, yeah we look at women in power, how we look at women in leadership, how we yeah we look in uh, at women in general. I would say yes, yes, I I agree. I think it's you know one reflects is a reflection of the other really. Um, yeah, and do you know it, it's about whether we whether we trust women I mm. think um so you know the female body is is you know we, there's another whole history to be told there of, of the uh, you know this idea of the female body as something that is unreliable right um and that you know that the male body is the kind of clean straight uh simple ideal and that the female body is this kind of leaking crazy his, you know we have this idea of hysteria don't we which comes you mm. know the hy hysterical comes from the word for the uterus you know that we are led by hormones that we we we're we're hard to understand cyclical um, but really was that cyclical so uh, there's cyclical, yeah yeah and that that's all a disadvantage Mm. Um, and I, you know, what's happening now, I think, uh, you know, I've, I've actually was seeing somebody on, um, Instagram the other day, who's talking about business, um, but by running your own business and how to do so following your hormonal cycle. Yeah, that's, and that's quite a new idea really to be in, in any kind of mainstream conversation. Um, because we have this idea that the, the hormonal cycle is something we should, we should, we should do well in spite of. Not that we should use to our advantage. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. It's like this linear way of living, um, and we kind of need to adapt our yeah cyclical way of being to that lit linear way of living, of doing business, of the way we look at time. We had a very interesting conversation. Uh, I had a very interesting conversation with uh, Kate Northrup about this. Uh, she's she's from the US and she also wrote about the cyclical living because uh, in the end, um, the way we look at time now is much more from a linear perspective with a beginning and an end. And we just need to kind of, you know, <laughs> work towards the end constantly to, uh, whilst when you look at nature and actually when you look at women it's it's cyclical here there and and it constantly evolves yeah and being female is is different um to being male and that's kind of like a controversial thing to say <laughs> especially perhaps when we're trying to think about business and we're trying to think about we want you know that desire to be on an equal footing um we we've sometimes I think that there's a pressure to play down um, what makes us different and unique as women. Mm. Oh, we have a little bit of a freeze here. Okay. Yeah. I hope that she's over back. Hmm, hey Millie, yeah. Oh you're, hi. You're back. You're back. Yeah. You were... I don't know what happened then. I've got full signal and everything. No worries. No worries. Sorry. You 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 
you were gone for for a few <laughs> seconds, but you're there. You're back. <laughs> yeah. No worries. We will we will make sure that that this will be edited out. But um, uh, so you were you were saying uh, that the uh, and, and and perhaps you can um, uh, yeah say that again. It's like yeah. that there that it's quite controversial to say um, that we are different and that in in general we try to kind of dim it down versus use it for our, uh, to our advantage. Yeah. So, you know, it's in, in a, particularly perhaps in the world of business, this idea that men and women are different is something that maybe women have feel under pressure to play down a bit um, mm. and to, you know, to hide away our differences. Um, but when it comes to biology, there are, there are some fundamental differences, I guess. And we, we do, you know, we, we do have, um cycles and you know uh there's more conversation now around menopause as well which i think is another really interesting experience that women have that men don't um so you know that these are all um these are things that set us apart um and that sometimes i think culturally we're encouraged to think of as uh weaknesses failings or negative um experiences that we would we would be better without because then we'd be men. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's kind of, you just have to deal with it. You don't speak about it. It's uh, some, some of these conversations are a bit, uh, people feel ashamed to have them, uh, to open up about, um, certain, uh, uh, yeah, well, complaints or, or issues that they face because of it. And yeah. as, especially at the work floor, um, yeah, there is a kind of a taboo, I would almost say, to um, to go against that linear grid of you know performance, um, always be on uh, and yeah on your best possible um, uh, level of performance. Whilst yeah. that for a lot of women that's different, uh, day by day, week by week. Uh, and also face by face. Yeah. You know, ovulation is something that it's hardly ever taught about or talked about. Um, you know, certainly I think that's changing, but I know that I was probably in my, you know, I'd probably been menstruating for a decade at least before I, a friend of mine said to me, I was sitting with her and I always remember it. She went, Oh, I said, Oh, what's the matter? And she said, Oh, nothing. I'm just ovulating. And I was like, what? And she was like, Oh, yeah I know when I'm ovulating and I was and I was like really and she was like yeah I, I know what side I'm ovulating from I can feel it and I was like whoa you know <laughs> I had never been told right that I might be able to tell when I was ovulating um and you know as you know I've done another book that's for preteen girls yes. about periods and the menstrual cycle and it was really important to me that that book wasn't you know so often menstrual education even for like nine ten year olds it's all based around oh you're going to get this period you know don't worry it's only a bit of blood here's the, this is the pad this is the tampon this is the cup you know and that's it sort of yeah. thing yeah. there isn't that whole picture given yeah. to young girls about their cycle a lot of people just have to you know find out by other means it's not part of their sort of basic education to know that they're going to have this cycle and and the gift of ovulation many women will agree is you know that you do get this kind of huge increase in your energy and your creativity levels and it was interesting researching the book about periods because i had a you know an expert uh reader you know as happens in publishing you know look at everything i'd said and she yeah. was like sometimes she would say well, what's the evidence? You know, what do you mean? You you feel you have better energy levels around ovulation. I was like, you know, so off I go trying to find out. And it's actually very, very difficult because mm. not, we all know it, we all talk about it, but there's hardly ever been any research into all of these things. And it's only just beginning to happen now. I know there was, um, I can't remember who it was recently, but a, a sports uh, woman was talking about how, she, you know, the depth oh, shit. detrimental effect of certain times in her cycle on her times, you know, and she was like, somebody needs to research this, you know? Yeah. Um, there's, there's a lot we don't know about the female body, but, but we can, we can use to our advantage, not just to our detriment. 
Absolutely, absolutely. And um, I mean, not not too long ago, um, when we switched on the telly, uh, the um, the way uh, menstruation blood was shown was blue, right? Or yeah. or <laughs> colorless, <laughs> or you know, and we we would see happy jumping women in white running yeah. through fields and you know having the best time of their lives whilst we all know that this is different um yeah. so it's super important also that uh, you wrote that book and in general um what i what i learned also from your book giving birth like a feminist is that um just taking this very important um uh, event in your life as an opportunity to get yeah to be empowered actually as a woman and uh, instead of feeling um yeah um yeah well disempowered uh, feeling have uh, lo looking back at the event as something that overcame you is mm. so important not not only for the event itself and the way you look at it um, later on, but also for the rest of your life and the way sure. you make, um, you look at business decisions or uh, career decisions or yeah, other. Yeah. I mean, that is totally, I think, a way in which women are being let down and done a disservice, you know, going back to birth being a feminist issue and why women, all women should care about this, even if they're not ever gonna have a baby. You know, it's because that when when you talk to all different women who've had babies, the one of the women groups of women that I find most interesting to talk to and I have the most fire and passion around it is the women who've had what I call kind of hands-off births. So they've had a birth where it wasn't done to them; they did it. Mm. They not. I'm not saying they weren't in hospital or they weren't in a a birth center or they didn't have any midwives with them although there are some women who do free birth but I'm not talking about them specifically it can be in any setting but it's a woman who's being attended by a midwife who has the confidence in the woman to do it mm. who holds back sits on her hands sometimes people even say knits or crochets and the woman does it that woman, when she talks to you about that experience, will talk about it in the most powerful terms. She'll talk about being a lioness and roaring and never feeling the same again. And she, she will always tell you, for the whole of the rest of my life, I will never be afraid of anything. I will always feel that I have that power inside me. I access something. It's like a, a, something gets switched on um, inside her that makes her feel like she has huge new levels of power and courage and ability. So I think that's really an, inc an incredible thing when you hear them, women talk like that. And the other thing that's interesting about it is that they are in such a tiny, tiny minority, women who have that kind of birth. Mm. It's incredibly rare to have a birth where nobody does anything to you, nobody touches you, everyone stands back and you are allowed, and I use that word, <laughs> you know, in inverted commas, but you're, you know, you're enabled um, to give birth yourself under your own steam and to feel that power. And in some cases, catch the baby yourself. You know, the baby is born into your hands. I was given the opportunity, just to, to point out that this isn't a judgment of anyone. I mean, I was given the opportunity to catch my own baby and I absolutely couldn't. I was, I remember saying to my midwives, I'm too busy. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not, for, not all of these things are for everyone and they don't all have to be in place for you to have a positive birth experience, but that, experience where you feel so powerful why is that so hard for women to get their hands on if you like to, to access yeah and and you mentioned positive birth experience so what what is a positive birth experience according to you well that's exactly what it is it's not according to me it's according to each individual woman ah. um who has a baby Right. Um, you know, I was talking to a woman this morning about her birth experience. She feels very positive about it. She had a hospital birth. She had an epidural and then she had a cesarean and she feels very positive about it. And 100 percent, I support her assessment of that 
birth mm. as positive you know it's not there's so much judgment around women's choices and women's lives um, and birth and parenting and motherhood are a real hotbed for judgment so it's really really important that we just listen to women if they say that they've had a positive experience that they have right um so yeah but I mean I think most often women who say they've had a positive experience feel that they were listened to during that experience they would feel like they were respected they feel that they were powerful in that experience autonomous um and that they you know they were the key decision maker in the room um and that's ma mainly what makes birth positive Having said that, a lot of women do really want to have a birth where they feel the power of their bodies. And for a lot of women, that is a positive experience. Um, but that's not the only way to have a positive birth experience. It really is down to what, what each individual woman wants and how she's treated. Yeah, so so also when you speak about uh, and when you use words like um, uh, autonomous decision and uh, what she really wants, um, we also speak about consent, I think. Um, can you can you elaborate a bit more on consent and, and, and what is happening often in the birth room uh, uh, when that doesn't work out in the way? Yeah. Yeah, well, I think there's... There's a lot of confusion about um, birth uh, and consent, really, <laughs> even amongst medical professionals. I think um, we have this we have this this huge cultural history of the female body not being um, something that is you know can be relied upon, and women's voice not being something that can be relied upon. Um, we've seen Roe versus Wade in America yes. just recently be overturned. That isn't just about abortion. All of that history around women not being able to make decisions around their own bodies is, is wider than just abortion. So I think it's about, you know, it goes right back to this idea of a woman as a vessel, as a container, Um, in fact, that's what they used to think, go back to the history of birth, that's what they used to think happened. They used to think that a little tiny person, this is in the like 14th and 15th centuries, this thing called a homunculus, which was like a tiny little mini person, was put inside the woman um, by the man and then grew and then was born. So the woman was literally, a man was the, the man was the person that did the creation, creation right. completely. And the woman was just the incubator for that little person as it grew. Um, at the, and, you know, we see that now, you know, when people talk about uh, women's autonomy in America, for example, women have been called host bodies. So it's just this idea that we just, we don't do anything when we're pregnant. We just host this baby. Mm. Anyway, <laughs> it's complicated, isn't it? But it's, it's um, it, when it comes to consent, I think it's, that all of that is there under the surface. Um, and this idea that the most important thing is for the, is the baby um, and that the woman can't necessarily be trusted and that the baby has to be, you know, all that matters is a healthy baby as the saying goes. Yeah. Um, and I think that, as long that as the vessel play. is still alive <laughs> or yeah. something. So, you know, you can listen to the woman, but if the woman says, I don't want to do this, and you as the medical professional think, well, that's not the right decision, mm. you can override that decision, you know, and that's, you know, that's not consent. No. <laughs> It's, there are many, many stories, you know, unfortunately, of, of women who, um, after the birth is over, feel that they, they didn't consent and that their decisions were uh, over, overridden. Right. Um, during birth. But, yeah. but ultimately in the law, you have the right to say no, even if you're putting yourself at risk and even if you're putting your baby at risk. Mm. You, you, in the law, you cannot be compelled to make uh, a decision unless you lack capacity, which is very, very unlikely and unusual situation. Right. Yeah. And I think that's also such an important point. And also the point that you were raising on uh, as long as the baby is healthy, where we actually transfer the, uh, let's say, th the importance of um, yeah having a healthy baby, that it's more, it weights heavier, much heavier than the um, 
mental or physical state of the woman yeah. uh, once once she starts giving birth. And I think that is also um, an argument that, especially when it's used in the birth room, uh, can be very um, difficult because... Yeah, most probably uh, uh, the woman as well as uh, the partner are, you know, very much focused on, okay, we, we want a healthy baby. And of course, if somebody else then says, you know, you have to do this or that because otherwise you might risk this or this or that, it's it's uh, very difficult to, bal- yeah, to balance your uh, own needs, especially with all the hormones and everything that is happening. Uh, especially, and I think that's also why it's so important to think before the delivery uh, about these kind of things and to, for instance, read your book. Um, because if you, if you have to make a decision at that moment, uh, it will be really hard. And then the argument of, yeah, you want a healthy baby or it might uh, risk the health of your baby is of course, yeah, very, um, Uh, wait emotive yeah yeah that's the word emotive yeah yeah totally that's that's true and um you know the the important thing to say as well is that you know almost without exception women have the well-being of their baby Mm. uppermost in their mind and as their biggest priority so again it's about trusting women you know we don't we don't it sometimes feels a bit subversive and dangerous to say oh it's okay for women to challenge uh, these power dynamics, but actually most women won't because they will want to put their trust in their, their care providers. And that's right. a good thing. Um, you know, one of the examples that I, I use in my book is about um, a sexual relationship. And you might be in a sexual relationship with your partner for five, 10, 20, 30 years. And you might never say no during that period of time which is fine, that's up to you. But the point is, you hopefully, if your relationship is a healthy, safe relationship, you know that you can say no. Mm. And that if you do, your partner will immediately stop. Mm. So your relationship is built on that unspoken understanding. Mm. In the birth room, often the relationship in the birth room between care provider and woman is not built on that understanding. There is, that isn't in place. So it's not about, I guess what I'm trying to say is, is that it's not about women saying no to everything in the birth room saying, uh, you know, going in all guns blazing, ready for a fight. You know, I am the autonomous woman in this situation and I will be in charge of everything. It's not about that. It's about a woman knowing that she can say stop and whatever is happening will stop because Mm. that is autonomy. You don't Mm. have to exercise it in order for it to be important that it's in place. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And um, Millie, you mentioned that you've spoken a lot also to women uh, who didn't have a positive birth experience. And I know a few um, as well. So I was wondering whenever they listen to this podcast, what would you recommend uh, if, if you look back and, um, you, yeah, you have a healthy child, but when you when you look back honestly to your birth experience, you're like, yeah, well, um, it 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 perhaps was even traumatizing or. Well, first of all, I would say to remind yourself that you matter too. You know, we've talked about this this phrase that gets trotted out of a healthy baby is all that matters. Mm. And a lot of women who have had traumatic experiences do get told that or something along those those similar lines. You know, right. like, look at your lovely baby in your arms, you know, look how beautiful they are. And, you know, this is in the midst of trying to tell somebody else um, about this traumatic experience. So I think it's really important to say to those women, yes, you have a healthy baby and you also matter. And what happened to you was important. I think that's the first step because sometimes um, it's so diminished for women um, that they will then diminish it themselves. Like I said, and sort of say, oh, you know, well, this is just what birth is like and wasn't it grim and I just had to get through it. Mm. And then secondly, I really do think that um, if women, um, obviously the next thing you know, they need to do is to find somewhere to talk to somebody about what happened to you, whether that's your partner, your mom, your friend, a counselor, a therapist, um, you know, somebody who specializes in birth trauma, your doctor, etc. 
you deserve to feel better. You deserve to be able to talk about that experience and to get the support you need. Mm. And also, if you can, I, I really think you need to complain because, you know, I think that's part of the problem is that not enough women feel uh, strong enough um, or like they're going to get heard if they do raise their voice and say, what happened to me did not feel right. It, um, it went beyond, um, you know, the care provider uh, trying their best to do the right thing. And it's tipped over into something that felt wrong. You know, maybe your consent wasn't sought or you felt violated or you felt disrespected. And if that, that happened, it's, if you can, it's so great to make a complaint because it helps other women. It's kind of feminist activism, I think, to do that. Because if, if you don't, if, if women don't use their voices to say, actually, that could have been better for me, then it's, it's not going to ever get better for, you know, the next women coming through that experience. But I do, I, I do appreciate it's not always possible for women to do that. And it, it's down to the individual where you're at and what support you've got. Mm, absolutely, absolutely. But there are three important points that you raise. So for first of all, first of all, it's about acknowledging uh, that you matter too. And then second of all, it's it's like speaking about it because I think the second point, um, since we tend to focus on the wellness of the baby and you have a healthy baby and you should be grateful because you have a healthy child um often the the birth experiences uh, that weren't that positive are kind of you know uh sweeped under the carpet and uh yeah. and and are are not spoken about um and uh, and i think also speaking about it uh nowadays you see a lot of uh, women sharing their positive birth experience on Instagram, on uh, uh, yeah, on other social media, which I think is also a good thing, right? To show that it can be a very positive experience. But at the same time, I also think that we should share more of the not so positive experiences to, to yeah, to um, acknowledge that that's also still happening. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I started the the hashtag uh, a few years ago, um, Me Too in the birth room. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the, I know there's a limit to the parallels we can draw there. Um, I'm aware of that. But I think that there, that there are some strong parallels in terms of the collective voice, mm. um, you know, the power of the collective voice. And what happens when with, you know, what happened with Me Too was that when one woman, when women started to speak out about experiences, which maybe they had diminished that maybe mm. felt small. It wasn't about um, major, it wasn't in every case, it wasn't about extremely clear cut um, violations. Mm. It was for some women about just the water cooler moments, you know, where they, that they'd been just put up with. Um, and once women started to, once the kind of lid came off that, it just snowballed because mm. it made other women realize, oh my God, that happened to me and I didn't even clock it. You know, it was so acceptable, so socially acceptable for, for my life in an office to, to involve that kind of stuff that I didn't even really commit it to memory or hold on to it that much. And suddenly, it, you know, it all came back and it snowballed. And I think women telling about their negative uh, experiences in the birth room um, have, will have the same effect because I think sometimes, like, like I've said a couple of times while we've been chatting, you know, there's this idea that, that's just what birth is like, you know, just, you just have to suck it up. Um, that, that we need to challenge. Uh, it shouldn't be, you shouldn't come through to the other side of birth feeling damaged, violated, disrespected, traumatized. It just shouldn't be that way. No. Thank you, Millie. This is, this is all, this makes so much sense. And I, and I also really hope that, uh, that everybody who's listening and, and, well, will have a future birth experience or just had or had a birth experience, um, yeah, might look back or forward and think, okay, so what can I do? What can I put in place in order to avoid uh, uh, a negative birth experience as well as uh, how can I deal with 
um, the experience that I had. Um, are there any uh, yeah, tips uh, you can share uh, that help women uh, to have a positive birth experience? Well, I think um, first and foremost, um, I would definitely think about making a plan. Right. Um, I think birth plans are quite interesting um, because they they quite often get uh, mocked yeah. and joked about. Yeah. You know, like oh, here she comes, the birth, you know, birthzilla, the birth diva. You know, she's got all these fancy ideas about what she wants, and she's got this laminated birth plan. Ha ha ha! You know. Yeah, yeah, the um, laminated birth plan. Yeah. Yeah. So that that makes me think oh, that's interesting. <laughs> Why don't we like women with a plan? <laughs> right. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think there's definitely some some gold um, to be mined there in that. And I think that, um, you know, that the whole point of this this plan, I, the, 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 when people joke about plans, it's this idea that, you know, women are stupid, basically. So they've got this laminated plan and they're going to stick rigidly to it. And then they're going to be disappointed if they don't get everything on the list. Well, I think that's really patronizing to women. I don't think many women are going to go into a childbirth situation with that kind of, you know, rigid uh, mindset. Mm. The whole point about making a plan um, is getting informed. So like 80% of the value of, of birth planning is in actually learning about birth. And it's much, much better to go into any situation, whether it's a work situation or uh, childbirth or anything else, having done some homework, thought about what you want, talked to other people, um, you know, uh, thought about the forks in the road where there might be two options, all of these things. We, we do these things in business and in life and nobody hopefully bats an eyelid. And I, I think it's a really good thing to do if you're having a baby too. So yeah, that would be the main thing I would advise if you're pregnant listening to this is to think about, um, you know, don't bury your head in the sand. And don't let people say to you, oh, it's no, there's no point making a plan. You just got to go with the flow because, yeah, the flow is all right if it's your flow. But if it's somebody else's flow, um, it's not always what you want. So, you know, get prepared, basically. And uh, don't don't be rigid. Of course not. But I don't need to tell women that because they're not stupid. <laughs> no. Make a plan A, make a contingency plan, make a cesarean plan, you know. Make, make a plan for every eventuality and think about what you want. And I think that definitely then helps you on the day because then you can then you can surrender because there is this kind of mix in birth between um, trying to, to, to have control, but also surrender. And there comes a point where one has to tip over into the other and you, you have to go inwards. You have to spiral inwards when you're in labor. Um, there's this lovely saying, um, that a woman in labor um, has to go to the stars and come back with her baby, which I love. Wow, and that is, yeah. <laughs> it is like that. It does feel like that. Um, you do, it is almost like um, a trip, <laughs> you know, um, a, a, it's quite psychedelic. Mm. And you, 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 there's a whole cocktail of hormones going around your body and you, you do spiral inwards and you do need to go on this, this journey um, into yourself to find that strength and that power and you don't need to be thinking about um, you know birth plans or any any other practical matters when you're at that point so you need to do that beforehand and then you need to let go <laughs> yeah exactly well thank you so much Millie uh, thank you so much for this wonderful advice thank you also for sharing uh, yeah a bit of the historical path that we that that we went through and and why we're here uh where we are at this point what dynamics are be um behind uh and um yeah and also how a positive birth experience um can that well does not mean that you have to have this quote-unquote natural birth or whatever that may mean right uh yeah. but that you actually have a birth experience that um is according to yeah your your consent and 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 um uh, that is when you look back is something that you look positive 
back at and that we should trust women more in their way of approaching birth as well as yeah the way they look at their birth afterwards absolutely yeah so um millie if people would like to know more about you where can they find you oh well i'm all over the place i guess um i've got a website um which is milliehill.co.uk and that's m-i-l-l-i-h-i-l-l um and yeah i'm on twitter i'm on instagram i'm on facebook uh i'm trying tiktok to reach <laughs> uh younger girls and uh, talk to them about periods at the moment it's my little uh have you started project. dancing already 30 followers on tiktok <laughs> have you so, started yeah, dancing um, already or uh no. Say that again. Have you started dancing already on TikTok? No, <laughs> no, I haven't started dancing yet. No, I don't know if that's going to happen, to be honest. <laughs> well, what will happen is that we have an amazing giveaway. Um, you can win Millie's book, Give Birth Like a Feminist. And if you want to win, it's very easy. Make a print screen of this podcast, post it on your Instagram stories, tag us, New Female Leaders and Millie Hill. And then we share it with our community as well. Do this before March 31st, 2023. And we will pick a winner after that date. Millie, thank you so much for sharing all your uh, wisdom and knowledge. And um, yeah, thank you for listening. And if you feel like, oh, I love this podcast so much. We would be super excited if you give us a ranking in Spotify. You can do that easily on your phone right next to our logo. Thank you so much, Millie. Thank you ever so much for having me. It's been great. And thank you so much for listening. Bye.